Reverend Jennifer is out of the pulpit, and I have to remember about the green button. So, <laughs> welcome to worship with the Universalist Unitarian Church of Peoria. I'm Jessica Laughlin, and it is my pleasure to serve here as the director of Lifespan Religious Education of this congregation. We strive to live out our mission to embrace freedom, love inclusively, grow in mind, body, and spirit, and to help heal our world. Let us pause to respect the peoples of the Peoria Nation, whose ancestors welcomed and assisted the first Europeans to visit this place. The Peoria's traditional homeland, the very ground upon which we gather this morning. Thank you for joining us in person as well as online. Stay for visiting in the Zoom room or in Fellowship Hall. We'll have coffee, connection, and a chance to get to know each other a little better. Please consider wearing a name tag so we may get to know you better. I ask that now you put your respective devices to worship mode, so that would be either off, or on silent, whichever you prefer. If somebody needs help with that, raise a hand. We'll have a tech ambassador help you out. And if you need a little more boost in the audio, we have some hearing assist devices as well that the ushers can help you with. The theme for worship and religious education this month is love. We have asked if ours really is the church of love. We've looked at the heart of Islam, and today we will be grounding ourselves in love. The Reverend Karen Bringelson is our guest in the pulpit today, and she comes to us from Lake Country Unitarian Universalist Church in Heartland, Wisconsin. A UU for over 30 years, she earned her Master's of Divinity from Meadville Lombard Theological School in 2020. Prior to that, she earned degrees in sociology, African American studies, educational policy studies, and library and information studies, working for the majority of her career as a librarian. My other church. <laughs> when she's not reading a good book, Karen enjoys bike riding, promoting intellectual freedom, cooking, and co-creating intersectional justice, singing, and collaging. She lives in Heartland, Wisconsin, with her wife, Bev, and lots of houseplants. It's a pleasure to rever welcome Reverend Karin to our congregation. Now, just a couple of brief announcements. At four o'clock this afternoon, you're all invited to join us for a imbalk ritual in Fellowship Hall. 
We'll be marking the Wiccan Sabbat with a ritual and potluck to follow. Also, I'd like to note that our congregation is hoping to discuss the common read, the UU common read for 2023, and it is entitled Mistakes and Miracles, Congregations on the Road to Multiculturalism. It's a case study of four congregations and their successes and challenges on that road. After it's read, our discussions will talk about how we can apply those lessons here in our church as we strive to create the beloved community. So now I invite you to take out your hymnal and rise as you are willing or able and turn to hymn number 95. There is more love somewhere. Edith will play us through all the way, one time so we can hear the melody, and then we'll join in in singing all four verses. Our opening words this morning come from the Unitarian Universalist minister, the Reverend Teresa Soto. In this community, we hold hope close. We don't always know what comes next, but that cannot dissuade us. We don't always know just what to do, but that will not mean that we are lost in the wilderness. We rely on the certainty beneath, the foundation of our values and ethics. 
We are the people who return to love like a North Star and to the truth that we are greater together than we are alone. Our hope does not live in some glimmer of an indistinct future. Rather, we know the way to the world of which we dream. And by covenant and the movement forward of one right action and then the next, we know that one day we will arrive at home. I invite the Regina and Riley Stanley family to come forward to light our chalice this morning. There you go. The Sacred Power of Justice by Jamie A. Yandel. We light this flame to ignite the sacred power of justice. We light this flame so that it may be a beacon of hope. In moments of uncertainty, fear, anxiety, and the unknown. We light this flame and are emboldened by its blaze. Knowing our strength as a prophetic and powerful people is rooted in the diverse ways we answer the call to love. Wheel in a wheel, wheel in a wheel, wheel in a wheel, in a wheel, my wheel in a wheel, wheel in a wheel, in a wheel, great God Almighty, wheel, wheel in a wheel, in a wheel, my Lord, wheel in a wheel, wheel in a wheel, in a wheel, Ezekiel saw the wheel, wheel in a wheel, wheel in a wheel, way up in the middle of the air, Ezekiel saw the wheel. Some folks go to church for to sing and shout. Playing in the middle of the air. Before six months, they're all turned out. Wait up in the middle of the air. Now let me tell you what a hypocrite will do. Way in the middle of the air. He'll talk about me and he'll talk about you. Way up in the middle of the air. Ezekiel saw the wheel, wheel in a wheel, in a wheel, my Lord. Wheel in a wheel, wheel in a wheel, in a wheel, great God Almighty. Wheel in a wheel, in a wheel, my Lord. Wheel in a wheel, in a wheel, in a wheel. Ezekiel saw the wheel, wheel in a wheel, wheel in a wheel. Way up in the middle of the air, Ezekiel saw the wheel. Way up. In the middle of the end, Ezekiel saw the little wheel runs by faith, and the big wheel runs by the grace of God. Oh, wheel, little wheel, way up in the middle of the end. You better watch out, sister, how you walk on the cross. Way in the middle of the end. Lest your foot might slip and your soul get lost. Way up in the middle of the air. Now one of these days round twelve o'clock. Way in the middle of the air. Well, this old world's gonna reel and rock. Way up in the middle of the air. Ezekiel saw the wheel, wheel in a wheel, wheel in a wheel, wheel, my Lord. Wheel in a wheel, wheel in a wheel, wheel in a wheel, 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 great God Almighty. Wheel, wheel in a wheel, wheel in a wheel, 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 w
Thomas. I'm chair of the worship committee and a member of the board, and I am so grateful for this church, and that church is all of you. Um, and one of the things I'm most grateful about is the way our church participates in social action. Today, when we pass the plate around, we have a custom called Share the Plate. Uh, we've chosen an organization who represents our UU values, and we will split the money the loose offering between that organization and the church. Uh, this month's uh, Share the Plate recipient is CASA. <laughs> this month's Share the Plate recipient is CASA. It works with the 10th Judicial Court. Uh, it's called the Court Appointed Social Special Advocates, and are, they're qualified, compassionate advocates that work with the uh, overloaded juvenile court system. Um, their goal is to make sure that every child is placed in a safe and a permanent home. Uh, you can indicate on your check or your offering envelope if your gift is for the church, for your pledge, or for the money to be split between the church and CASA, or if you want all of the funds to go to CASA. When I give to this church, it's a uh, demonstration of my gratitude. My gratitude for all the friends I found here, my gratitude for all the social impact, my gratitude for just being around a community that cares. So when you give today, please give as the spirit moves you. After the ushers have finished passing the plate, I invite you to come and light candles of caring, of joys and concerns, of celebrations and commiserations. Will the ushers please pass the plate?
share some of the joys and concerns in the hearts and mind of our congregation. We celebrate with the Lindsay family as Owen is released from the hospital after a very lengthy stay. He was a quite, quite a ill young man for a while, and he's adjusting to a new residential home. Uh, let's send warm energy to the family as they recoup from this trying time, and they have sent their thank yous and appreciations to the support they've gotten from the congregation. The Cofield family has recently shared with us that Pat has been diagnosed with lung cancer. They request any positive energy, healing wishes, prayers, whatever is your style, to be sent their way during this difficult time. This week marks the one year anniversary of the invading of Ukraine by Russia. Let's send wishes of peace and resolution to that region. And let's also hold in our hearts those Turkish citizens who are still dealing with the aftermath of the, of the earthquake from two weeks ago. And then there'll be another moment of silence while I light candles for joys and sorrows, names and milestones that remained in our hearts and are unspoken. Our story today is called Sustaining the Tree of Life by Lynn Gardner. The tree stood in the middle of the village. Its trunk was so large that it took six people holding hands to reach around it. The roots were strong and wide, and its branches spread over the village square, offering their shelter from the rain or shade from the summer sun. Its fruit was juicy and sweet and abundant. The people of the village loved the tree. The children played beneath it and climbed its lowest branches. The young people knew that if you whispered your dreams to the tree, they were more likely to come true. People who proclaimed their love or friendship for one another beneath its branches found their relationships to be nourishing and elders discovered that their sweetest memories could be counted on when they were near the great tree. The tree had been witness to so much, and, and when the breezes blew through the leaves, one could hear the echoes of generations, laughter, conversations, dreams, prayers, and song. Animals loved the tree too, Rabbits lived in the burrows beneath the roots, and squirrels and monkeys lived in its branches, and the bats and birds flew in to eat the plentiful fruit. The tree seemed to buzz with life. One day, a traveling merchant arrived in the village. He rested in the shade and ate two pieces of delicious fruit. This fruit is incredible. He said, I would like to have some to sell in the next villages I visit. Who owns this tree? No one owns this tree, replied a villager. If anything, we belong to it. <laughs> well then, no one owns the tree. No one will mind if I pick the fruit, said the merchant, and he began to fill a basket. I mind, said the villager, and today I am the keeper of the tree. <sighs> What do you mean, the keeper of the tree? We each take our turn being here with the tree. We could never own it. We are, as, we are here as protectors, as sustainers. That's ridiculous. This tree doesn't need you. You just take what you need. The tree will continue. But the villager could not be persuaded Sir, this tree isn't like that. We don't come here to take from it, even though we receive much. We are keepers of the tree because this is where we are nourished. This is where some of our most precious memories are and where we remember who we want to become. 
Well, you may think this tree is very special, but it still doesn't need you to sit with it. That's preposterous. Ah, replied the villager. The tree itself may not need me, but what of the others who come by? Just this morning, I sat with a woman whose heart was heavy with worry. Had I not been here, she would have had no one to carry the weight with her. And this afternoon, a tired couple came and rest beneath its branches with me. They had said they had been looking for a place just like this. And then an elder came by, and we watched the birds in the branches together. And now you are here. You were confused about what this tree is and how to be with it. Imagine if you had arrived and had not found anyone here to talk with you. You might have continued thinking that everything you do is all about you. <laughs> Luckily for you, my friend, I'm here to let you know that when you care for the tree of life, it becomes so much more than about just you. And so the merchant sat for a while sat in the shade thinking about these ideas that felt new and a little bit challenging. As the sun went down, he picked up his bag and headed out of town, whistling a song that he hadn't thought of in years. On his way, he shared a smile with those he passed, his heart feeling strangely light and joyful. And the people of the village? Well, they continued to sustain the tree of life, to care for one another, and to share their gifts with grace and gratitude. May it be so for each of us. I wonder what gifts you'll carry forth from this day. The children are now invited to join me for religious education back in the RE Commons. The congregation can sing us out with Go Now in Peace. UU congregations covenant with one another to affirm and promote specific principles. We live out those principles within a living tradition of wisdom and spirituality that is drawn from many sources as diverse as science, poetry, scripture, and personal experience. Today's source of inspiration is an excerpt from a speech that the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. delivered in April of 1957 almost 66 years ago. He was speaking at the Conference on Christian Faith and Human Relations in Nashville, Tennessee. It was a three-day event designed to explore the role of Southern religious organizations in alleviating racial tensions. His role, his speech was entitled, The Role of the Church in Facing the Nation's Chief Moral Dilemma. I kept the original male gendered language commonly used in the 20th century. Our ultimate end must be reconciliation. The end must be redemption. The end must be the creation of the beloved community. We have before us the glorious opportunity to inject a new dimension of love into the veins of our civilization. The type of love I stress here is not eros, a sort of aesthetic or romantic love, and not phila, a sort of reciprocal love between personal friends, but it is agape, which is understanding goodwill for all men. It is an overflowing love which seeks nothing in return. It does not begin by discriminating between worthy and unworthy people. It begins by loving others for their sakes, 
and makes no distinction between friend and enemy. It is directed towards both. It is this spirit and this type of love that can transform opposers into friends. It is love seeking to preserve and create community. It is the love of God working in the lives of men. This is the love that may well be the salvation of our civilization. Here ends the reading. I invite you to join in singing our hymn this morning, There is a Love. This is not located in our hymnal, so Edith will play it through once to help us hear the melody, then we will sing it together twice. Um, first, do we have the, first with the words um, holding me, and then next with the words holding us. So please rise in all the ways that we do and join in singing, There is a Love. You may be seated. Let me begin by thanking Reverend Jennifer for allowing me to preach in your pulpit this morning. She and I share a distinction of beginning our current ministries in August of 2020. Right in the middle. We thought, we hoped, we hoped it was the middle. It turned out to be the beginning of the pandemic. So all Zoom all the time back then, right? Masking and vaxxing and now all things multi-platform. It has been quite a ride. And you all are lucky to have Reverend Jennifer on your journey with you. Yes. So thank you for having me with you this morning. As I, was preparing to, as I was preparing to join you for worship this morning, I noticed on your website that the Universalist Unitarian Church of Peoria has a four-part mission statement. Embracing freedom, loving inclusively, growing spirituality, excuse me, growing spiritually, and healing our world. And it's actually on the front of your order of service, too. So given our topic for today of grounding in love, I was particularly delighted to read the fine print on your second theme. Loving inclusively reflects the universalist side of our heritage. We believe that everyone is welcome, everyone has worth and dignity, and everyone deserves love. Clearly, this is not your first rodeo with love today. You have been exploring love before and will continue to explore well into love well into the future. And like this congregation, I too have a multi-part mission statement. Mine is in three parts, and it is symbolized by a strong, beautiful, fruit-filled tree, much like the tree of life that Jesse and I told the story about. It's a th three-part mission, and the tree parts are grounding in love, the roots, growing in faith, the trunk, and engaging for justice, 
the branches and the fruit. Today, we'll dig into the roots, for perhaps I'm not alone in wanting to be grounding in love. The two parts of this topic, grounding and love, each come with a story about walking. So the first story comes from last fall when my wife Bev and I were taking a walk around our neighborhood. It was an after-dinner walk one evening in September when the days were getting shorter, but it was still invitingly warm outside. You have to remember, we were in in Wisconsin, so it's a little bit colder there than it is here. We had just passed a little free library, and uh, that was by the elementary school, and we heard some music playing. We noticed that the music was coming from the speakers at our friend Jake's house. And on that carefree autumn evening, we just could not help but to do a little dance to the beat. And much to our surprise, Jake could see us (laughs) uh, dancing on his sidewalk, so he called us over to his garage where he was working at a stand-up table. And on the table before him was a very large pot filled with dirt. And he was up to his elbows mixing soil, he said. As a master naturalist, Jake was busy preparing a nurturing environment for plants that he would soon be transplanting. Besides the large pot of soil and dirt all over his hands and arms, I remember the huge smile on his face. He was so happy, and I could relate. Many dedicated gardeners and farmers might tell you that their outdoor environment their garden of flowers or fruits, vegetables, or native plants, their ground is their happy place. Indeed, the smile on Jake's face was a testament to how the actual physical act of gardening can reduce stress and lift moods. Bonnie Grant is a certified urban agriculturalist who who uses science to back up this personal anecdote. Apparently, in soil, scientists have found antidepressant microbes, bacteria that help our moods and are also being studied because they might improve cognitive function, Crohn's disease, and even rheumatoid arthritis. I am in awe and give deep thanks for such antidepressant microbes. Besides being an antidepressant, The ground is also a place where radical transformation occurs. Those close to the land might call this composting, right? How many of you have ever done composting? Let me see a raise of hands, right? Radical transformation. Through an amazing natural process, dirt can take harmful carbon from the air and transform itself into nutrient-rich soil. Soil that sustains and nurtures the plants we need for our thriving. All it takes is the right ingredients of carbon and nitrogen, heat and water, air, worms, and time. With the right combination of these ingredients, the land can actually replenish itself. With such a superpower as self-replenishment, I like to start calling the land divine dirt and sacred soil. My feelings of awe around soil replenishment and calling it radical transformation, these are all indications of a particular theological framework. It's called the religious naturalist orientation. This is a perspective a worldview, and orientation that, just briefly I'll share with you, contains four key components. Naturalism, which is a view that everything that exists and all that occurs is due to natural processes, not supernatural ones. Second, the modern story of our origins is the Big Bang and evolution, offering ways for us to understand ourselves and our world. Third, 
all life exists in interconnected ecosystems. When we recognize this truth, it has profound implications. And finally, when we are amazed by and moved by the wonders of our lives and our world, we can embrace the experience as a religious response. A religious naturalist orientation encourages the awe of and the deep thanks for such natural processes as soil making, which is a process of and a site for radical transformation. Artistic representations of artistic repre representations are important to religious naturalist orientation. Here's a poem by contemporary Unitarian Universalist author Jess Reynolds. It's entitled, I Would Like to Be Buried Alive. In it, I perceive a blessedness of dirtiness, and I invite you to listen to it as a point of radical transformation. It goes like this. Spirit, plant me. Part the soil until there's room for me to curl up around myself and wait. I know there's life sleeping somewhere in the seed, just waiting for water and sun. Spirit, plant me. This is our covenant. You on your knees, up to your elbows in dirt, me stripped bare of bark or shell, risking wind and snow to give myself the chance to grow. To embody spirit and find ourselves on our knees up to our elbows in dirt takes some intentionality. The effort of digging down, of grounding, can be so deeply rewarding. Getting dirty and messy, yes, physically, but also theologically and spiritually, can be deeply healing and an enriching experience. It can be transformative. Now, to be fair, grounding is not without its risks. When we are being honest, getting dirty can be a vulnerable experience too. To be grounding will require us to be stripped bare of our hard coverings. Only when we are vulnerable to the spiritual elements that nourish us will we find ourselves a chance to grow. In so many ways, from science to poetry, we are reminded that grounding is a form of radical transformation, a site for growth, change, and evolution. Love, too, is a site for radical transformation. If we heed theologians like the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, we will learn that love, too, can replenish, create, and save us all. I actually saw love as radical transformation on a walk last fall. Bev and I were taking yet another walk. This time we were in Minneapolis visiting her sister Mary. And it was October and the leaves were bright yellow and orange and covering all the sidewalks and piling up in the gutters. And as we were walking around Mary's neighborhood, I suddenly saw a sign. Okay, sure, it was just a yard sign, but it was a new one for me. The sign read, LOVE, in all caps. And then below it, it said, YOUR NEIGHBOR. You may have heard this phrase before. LOVE YOUR NEIGHBOR. And then it had an asterisk by the word neighbor. It continued, YOU'RE BLACK brown, immigrant, disabled, religiously different, LGBTQ, fully human neighbor. Of course, the sign wasn't big enough to include all the neighbors who are pushed to the margins with little power or privilege. 
the neighbors who are formerly incarcerated, for example, or neighbors who are currently incarcerated, neighbors living with mental illness, neighbors in the throes of their addictions, neighbors without the financial means for stable housing. I'm sure you could think of more neighbors as we widen our circle of concern. And then there are the neighbors I'm not sure I want to love. The family members who repeat conspiracy theories that I don't agree with. The politicians and voters who think Christian nationalism is a good idea. The warmongering, power-hungry world leaders who kill everyday citizens with their self-righteous decisions. It's easy for me to think of neighbors I don't want to love. But that's not what Dr. King or our universalist ancestors invited us to do. They didn't say just love the neighbors with whom you agree. (laughs) They didn't say we could pick and choose. They said everyone was worthy of love. When we are faced with the hard task of loving everyone, especially when we are grounding in love, we look to our roots for encouragement and nourishment. We explore our heritage for inspiration. We turn, in this case, to our religious ancestors. Our universalist and Unitarian forebearers grew out of the Christian tradition in particular, and in general, excuse me, and in particular, the Protestant tradition. So this love your neighbor reminder is an integral part of our religious roots. When we turn specifically to understand universalist ancestors, we find love everywhere. Sometimes we explain that early universalists believed that God was too loving to damn anybody to an eternity in hell. There would be salvation for everybody. Salvation would be universal. We tell our stories about the 18th century universalist minister, John Murray. As an evangelist, he was spreading the good news about the kindness and everlasting love of God, giving people not hell, but hope and courage. And in exploring our 19th century ancestors, we learn about our universal we learn about universalist minister Hosea Ballou. He preached about the salvation for all, irrespective of character. Yet another example of a loving God. And then we turn to the 20th century Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He was not a universalist by name. Rather, he claimed a Christian worldview and spoke through the power of that tradition. But his 1957 speech resonates with our universalist roots. In the reading I shared earlier, Dr. King emphasized agape. He said, Agape is an overflowing love which seeks nothing in return. It does not begin by discriminating between worthy and unworthy people. It begins by loving others for their sakes and makes no distinction between a friend and enemy. It is directed towards both. Can you hear the universalism in his words? It's the same kind of universalism that this congregation articulates in its mission. Loving inclusively, we believe that everyone has worth and dignity and everyone deserves love. Agape is the kind of love that makes a place for radical transformation. We can hear that when Dr. King continues, agape in this type of spirit and this type of love that is the type of spirit and this type of love that can transform opposers into friends. It is love seeking to preserve and create community. This is the love that may well be the salvation of our civilization. Through these words, we are reminded that love, like divine dirt and sacred soil, 
is all about radical transformation. This is the kind of love we want to be grounding in. This is the kind of love that requires us to change and evolve, to replenish and nourish. This is the kind of love that does not discriminate between worthy and unworthy people. This is the kind of love that creates community and transforms hearts. This is the kind of love that is a site for radical transformation. This is the kind of love we want to be grounding in. Beloveds, though it has been 66 years since Dr. King suggested that agape may well be the salvation of our civilization, our society, our world, it still needs to be saved. It needs to be changed. It needs to be transformed. And when we are grounding in love, we are part of that change. We are part of that radical transformation. We are part of building the beloved community. So I invite you this week to go out and spread the good words of grounding and love. Be grounding in the ways that nourish your spirits and your bodies. Be loving in an overflowing way that seeks nothing in return. Be grounding in love, living out a life of radical transformation. Blessed be and amen. We will sing of love one last time. Edith is going to play it through for us once before we sing it together in, as a community. Love will guide us, number 131. Uh, I invite you to find it in your hymnal and rise in all the ways that we do, body and or spirit. We extinguish today's flame, our communal flame, but not the love and warmth of this community, and not our fire for commitment for transformation. We hold those in our hearts until we gather again. So I send you out into your weeks to change the world with your love. Blessed be and go in peace.